have the streaming started uh so uh, welcome everyone to the talk we are having today uh we have with us dr devaditya bhattacharya today who's uh, an assistant professor at kazi nasrul university uh devaditya bhattacharya has written extensively on the question of higher education online education and the new education policy uh we are having this talk today in the context of the new uh, notification that has been brought out by the ugc uh on concerning the blended mode of learning in higher education uh what this notice is basically trying to do is uh make online education a compulsory part of a large uh, part of our courses in higher education institutions and what we are trying to discuss today is that this is not the first time this is happening uh that online education and digitization has been pushed into higher education through a series of government policies uh initiatives and schemes uh from 2016 17 itself we have seen a push towards this kind of uh, online mode of learning where courses have been uh made available through uh, massive open online courses or moocs through platforms like uh, swayam from 2017 itself uh, in fact uh, a google and kpmg report that was brought out in way back in 2016 and 17 around that time period stated that given that india has a growing young population uh there's a huge market available in india for various private companies uh to set up platforms for online education and for online training online examinations online evaluations and entrance tests and coaching for the same and this market has been pegged at a huge amount of some 11 uh, billion dollars 17 itself and after that we've seen a huge shift through uh, things like swayam being set up and actually even different entrance tests which we gradually seen have been made uh, mcq based which have been made computer based tests over this growing period of time over the past 4 to 5 years and today we are like in this uh, context of the pandemic we are situated at a time where for the past 1 and 1/2 years we have experienced what actually the meaning of digital education will be for the majority of students of this country uh today's talk will be uh, held primarily in english with a mix of uh, english and hindi for most of the uh, viewers uh so some part of the context like i lay out again ki uh, aaj ka jo uh, discussion hum aayojit kar rahe hain professor devaditya bhattacharya ke sath wo टेंडेड मोड ऑफ लर्निंग लेके जो नोटिस आया है जिसमें ऑनलाइन एजुकेशन को एक बड़े हद तक कंपल्सरी बना दिया जा रहा है उसके ऊपर आज हम ये टॉक कर रहे हैं और कैसे ऑनलाइन एजुकेशन हमारे जिंदगी में और हमारे हायर एजुकेशन इंस्टीट्यूट में बड़े पैमाने पे लागू किया जा रहा है एनई और अन्य काफी स्कीमों के द्वारा अन्य काफी पॉलिसी लेवल डिसीजन ऑलरेडी लिए जा चुके हैं जिनके थ्रू ये ऑनलाइन एजुकेशन का जो सिस्टम है वो आने वाले दिनों में हमारे एजुकेशन में और बड़े पैमाने पे लागू होगा साल में अलग अलग मूवमेंट्स भी हुए हैं स्टूडेंट्स के डीयू, जेएनयू, एयूडी, देश के अलग अलग यूनिवर्सिटीज में स्टूडेंट्स ने ये बोला है कि ऑनलाइन एजुकेशन एक्चुअली एक डिस्क्रिमिनेटरी मोड है एजुकेशन का एक हद तक तो डिजिटल एक्सेस की बात है कि किसके पास लैपटॉप है किसके पास इंटरनेट का एक्सेस है उससे बड़ा भी एक इशू हुआ है पिछले आ, मतलब एक डेढ़ साल के एक्सपीरियंस में कि सिर्फ ऑनलाइन एजुकेशन एक्सेस करके पढ़ पाएगा उस एजुकेशन का मतलब क्या है इससे अलग अलग सवाल जुड़े हैं कि आ, जिस तरीके के कोर्सेज आप लाए जाएंगे जिसमें बोला जा रहा है कि आ, के अगर हम ऑनलाइन एजुकेशन को देखें कि अलग अलग स्तर पर लोग एक्चुअली वॉलेंटरली एग्जिट कर सकते हैं ऐसे कोर्सेज लेकर जिसमें कभी आपको सर्टिफिकेट मिलेगा कभी डिप्लोमा मिलेगा कभी आप एक बीए का डिग्री लेके निकलेंगे और कभी एक ऑनर्स का डिग्री लेके निकलेंगे अलग अलग स्तर के डिग्रीज का मतलब क्या है इसका लेबर मार्केट से क्या लिंक है इसका पेडोगोलॉजी के साथ क्या लिंक है ऐसे अलग अलग सवालों के साथ 
आज हम जोजेंगे और नाउ आई जस्ट वांट टू इनवाइट डॉक्टर देवदत्त से भट्टाचार्य टू बिगिन द सेशन एवरीवन हुज जॉइंड अस सेंड इन डिफरेंट क्वेश्चंस एंड कमेंट्स यू मे हैव इन द कमेंट बॉक्स हियर और ऑन द फेसबुक लाइव इनिशियल प्रेजेंटेशन हम लोग क्वेश्चन आंसर सेशन में वो क्वेश्चंस फिर uh, ले सकते हैं डॉक्टर देवदत्त Yes, uh, thank you, Shambhavi. Uh, I think, uh, Shambhavi, you've actually made it easier for me to chart out the field that we we've set out to try and talk about. Um, so, शुरू में ही राइट बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया शांतवि का और कलेक्टिव को राइट तो बहुत सारी क्रांतिकारी सलाम राइट तो कि इस तरीके का एक आयोजन किया गया है और जिसके जरिए भले ही हम ऑनलाइन मोड में ही ऑनलाइन मोड का चर्चा करें पर एटलीस्ट इस ऑनलाइन मोड को क्या भविष्य के टेम्पलेट के हिसाब से देखा जा सकता है इज इट अ वायबल फ्यूचर राइट फॉर हायर एजुकेशन एज वी इमेजिन इट राइट इज समिंग दैट वी रियली नीड टू ट्राई एंड टॉक अबाउट राइट सो वॉट आर द फ्यूचर फॉर हायर एजुकेशन दैट वी वॉन्ट टू इमेजिन एज स्टूडेंट्स एंड टीचर्स ऑफ द कंट्री राइट और एज सिटीजन ऑफ द कंट्री राइट सो वॉट काइंड ऑफ पब्लिक फंडेड एजुकेशन वॉट फॉर्म्स ऑफ पब्लिक public uh, funded uh, higher educational institutions do we want in the country right so or do we want to do away with the physical institution altogether and bring in online teaching and online learning in a major way the way this this entire blended learning uh, drive is actually going to lead us uh, so ye sare prashno ko thoda sa hum log address karne ki koshish karenge jaise ki shambhavi ne already ek field hum logo ke liye सेट आउट कर दिया है उसी फील्ड में जो जो प्रश्न का ऑलरेडी जिक्र शामी ने किया है उन्हीं प्रश्नों के साथ जूझने का कोशिश हम लोग करेंगे तो उन्हीं प्रश्नों को थोड़ा सा आलोचना के जरिए उन्हीं प्रश्नों का कुछ जवाब ढूंढने का कोशिश करेंगे तो जवाब जब पॉलिसी आलोचना है तो उसका कोई एक जवाब नहीं हो सकता है पॉलिसी आलोचना का जवाब कुछ कुछ ऑल्टरनेटिव इमेजिनेटिव एक्सरसाइज के जरिए हो सकता है तो वो एक्सरसाइज भी शायद हम लोगों को करना चाहिए एंड इट्स हाई टाइम दैट वी ट्राई एंड एंगेज इन द इमेजिनेटिव वर्क दैट इट टेक्स टू टू एन ऑल्टरनेटिव फ्यूचर फॉर हायर एजुकेशन इन इंडिया right so that is something that we have to do together and that is something that we have to do essentially collectively as a collective project and a collective exercise to isiliye jaise ki shambhavi ne bola hai ki mera bas kuch kuch chinta hai right so mera kuch kuch sochne ki kuch bindu hai bindu hai right kuch bindu ke पास राइट इर्द गिर्द मैं सोचने की कोशिश करूंगा राइट सो और मैं चाहूंगा कि आप लोग जो सुन रहे या देख रहे या आगे भी देखेंगे राइट सो तो आप लोग अगर थोड़ा चर्चा में आ पाए और कुछ प्रश्न करें कुछ कुछ आप लोगों का जो जो ओपिनियंस है राइट वो भी अगर थोड़ा उठ के आए तो शायद हम लोग कलेक्टिवली उस एक्सरसाइज को करने की कोशिश कर सकते हैं कि हाउ डू वी वांट टू इमेजिन द फ्यूचर ऑफ हायर एजुकेशन इन इंडिया दैट्स दैट्स प्रीटी मच द काइंड ऑफ क्वेश्चन दैट वी हैव टू ट्राई एंड एड्रेस टुडे मैं ज्यादातर केस में अंग्रेजी में थोड़ा बात बात रखने की कोशिश करूंगा क्योंकि जो डॉक्यूमेंटेशन है जिसके बेसिस पे मैं बात करूंगा उसमें वो एक इंग्लिश डॉक्यूमेंट है और ये भी मतलब आश्चर्यजनक है कि उस डॉक्यूमेंट का कोई भी ट्रांसलेशन निकाला नहीं गया है राइट सो इट्स अ 46 पेज कॉन्सेप्ट नोट एक पोजीशन पेपर जो कि निकाला गया है नोटिफिकेशन के साथ और उस उस कॉन्सेप्ट नोट को बस अंग्रेजी में ही निकाला गया है राइट सो एक टाइम पे हम लोग खोजने की कोशिश कर रहे थे कि उसका कोई हिंदी अनुवाद हुआ है या लाया गया है यूजीसी से या नहीं पर फिर पता चला कि उसका कोई भी हिंदी अनुवाद या हिंदी वर्जन अभी तक नहीं आया है तो तो कोई भी रीजनल लैंग्वेजेस में या कोई भी अलग दूसरे भाषा में इसका इसका कोई वर्जन नहीं है इस डॉक्यूमेंट का कोई दूसरा वर्जन नहीं है तो क्योंकि वो ओरिजिनल डॉक्यूमेंट ही इंग्लिश लैंग्वेज में है तो और उसका रेफरेंसेस कुछ कुछ मुझे थोड़ा यूज करना पड़ेगा इसलिए ज्यादातर बातचीत मैं अंग्रेजी में ही रखूंगा पर अगर आप में से किसी को भी कोई दिक्कत हो समझने में एट एनी पॉइंट ऑफ टाइम यू कैन प्लीज पोस्ट क्वेश्चन इन द चैट बॉक्स और यू कैन आस्क मी एट दी एंड then i will try and translate myself into whichever um, way uh, into whichever language uh, 
or let's say into uh, into easier english if possible okay so to to uh, just try and set out the field that has already been i think charted out by shambhavi to 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 great right so mera aaj ka jo vaktavya hai ya phir jo sochne ki jo jo limits hai right usme maine jaisa aapko bola hai already ki mera panch bindu panch bindu hai right i'm going to talk about five pointers that i have right and around those five pointers i'm going to try and weave an argument right so is argument ka mool jo jo prashn hai wo prashn maine already bol diya hai ki what is the the future of higher education that we want to emerge imagine for the country today ये जो पांच पॉइंटर्स मैं लेके बात करूंगा उनको मैं एक के बाद एक रह तो रखने की कोशिश करूंगा ऐसा नहीं है कि कोई भी एक पॉइंटर से उभर के कोई होलिस्टिक आर्ग्यूमेंट आएगा पर उसमें से कुछ आइडियाज बस प्लेस करने की कोशिश मैं करूंगा फर्स्ट पॉइंट दैट आई वॉन्ट टू बिगेन विद इज दैट इट्स नॉट us to just look at the notification that has come out from the UGC right so ek notification aaya hai jisme kaha gaya hai ki 40% uh, course load ko ya fir 40% credit requirement in any course can be transferred to the online mode right so or blended learning ka yahi ek model ek notification ke zariye laya gaya hai jahan pe bola gaya hai ki 60% aap zyada se zyada right so face to face ya physical classroom uh, uh, instruction ke zariye karwa sakte hai but at least 40% course content has to be delivered online right so has to be digitized right so to ye ek notification ke zariye laya gaya hai but as we all know that the devil lies in the detail the notification ko apne uh, intentions ke zariye samjhana sam, sam, samajhne ki zarurat hai right so koi bhi notification ko apna jo policy intention ke sath wo aata hai right so every notification if it is a bureaucratic or a legislative instrument to uske piche kuch policy intention hota hai to wo policy intention kya hai is notification ke piche usko samajhne ke liye ek dusra document usi ke sath publish kiya gaya hai aur jis document ka zikr maine already kiya hai wo ek concept no एक छियालीस पेज का एक कॉन्सेप्ट नोट है राइट और एंड a concept note which basically works as a position paper on blended learning us concept note ka kaam ye hai ki blended learning cheez kya hai isko samjhana aur logo ko ye bechna right so basically blended learning ka jo concept hai usko logo tak pahunchana aur usko bechne ki kaam ek paper ke zariye ek position paper ke zariye ek concept note ke zariye karne ki koshish kiya gaya hai now i want to begin by saying that ye jo concept note hai ye sabko padhna chahiye going to be an is going to be an immensely traumatic exercise right so and empathies are with each other right so that we have to survive the trauma of reading that document but we really have to read that document to understand the document not merely as specific policy intention as i said make राइट right? so, मेरे uh, 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 मेरे हिसाब से तो मुझे मान मेरा मानना है कि वो डॉक्यूमेंट इट सेल्फ ये कॉन्सेप्ट नोट जो पब्लिश किया गया है वो खुद ही में एक मेटाफर है पर है वो एक मेटाफर है ऑफ द एब्सोल्यूट वैक्यूअसनेस right so that we want to bring in in place of higher education right so us concept note ko agar aap padhenge to aapko pata chalega ki kitna kharab डिस्कोर्स हो सकता है एक देश में राइट right? so, एक एजुकेशन डिस्कोर्स का लेवल ऑफ कॉन्वर्सेशन या लेवल ऑफ कम्युनिकेशन राइट किस हद तक नीचे गिर सकता है और कितना वैक्यूअस कितना मीनिंगलेस कितना हॉलो एक डॉक्यूमेंट हो सकता है वो पढ़ के ही समझा जा सकता है इस डॉक्यूमेंट को आप अगर पढ़ेंगे मैं तो हाँ मतलब मैं ग्रामर सिंटैक्स लैंग्वेज ये सब छोड़ ही दे रहा हूं मैं बस बोल रहा हूं उसका अगर मैसेज भी आप निकालने का कोशिश करेंगे उसका जो निष्कर्ष है वो भी आप निकालने का कोशिश करेंगे तो आपको पता चलेगा कितना घटिया 
एक डॉक्यूमेंट हो सकता है उसी से पता चलेगा कि जो सिस्टम लाने की कोशिश इस डॉक्यूमेंट कर रहा है राइट right? ये वाला डॉक्यूमेंट जो सिस्टम लाने की प्रोपोजल रख रहा है वो सिस्टम कितना घटिया हो सकता है डेफिनेटली इट इज अ प्रोडक्ट ऑफ ऑनलाइन सिस्टम ऑफ एजुकेशन दैट मस्ट प्रोड्यूस दिस एंटायर डॉक्यूमेंट एज वी हैव इट राइट सो आई थिंक द डॉक्यूमेंट इट सेल्फ एज आई सेट इज अटर फॉर राइट इज अटर फॉर ऑफ द of the of the sheer hollowness of the system that we are trying to bring in place now why do i say this why do i say that this is a metaphor is a question that we have to get into right so um shayad pata hoga and i'm sure that a lot of us right would have spoken about this at uh, uh, at the time when it came out right so, but uh, there there was this sudden bubble around the world class institution or the world class university that was manufactured around uh, 2014 2015 2016 right so pretty much around the same time right so that this this entire drive towards digital education was happening and usi samay mein right so world class institutions ka bhi ek set of guidelines laya gaya tha ugc se राइट right? so, और उस गाइडलाइंस को अगर आप पढ़ेंगे तो आपको पता चलेगा कि वर्ल्ड क्लास का जो डेफिनेशन दिया गया था वो बेसिकली ये था व्हाट इज अ वर्ल्ड क्लास इंस्टीट्यूशन अ वर्ल्ड क्लास इंस्टीट्यूशन इज वन व्हिच हैज वर्ल्ड क्लास टीचर्स वर्ल्ड क्लास इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर एंड वर्ल्ड क्लास स्टूडेंट वॉज एन एक्सरसाइज इन सेल्फ डेफिनेशन it was an exercise in self reflection right so where the only way in which you can define yourself is by referring to yourself right so that was what the world class institutions definition was no wonder that a geo institute had to get uh, that kind of a tag of institute of eminence but this blended learning concept is also exactly a repeat of that model of self referential if you read the document you will realize that blended learning has been defined at several points in the document and how has it been defined what is blended learning blended learning is an appropriate blend of online teaching and face to face teaching blended learning is an apt blend of great curriculum and adequate infrastructure learning is the correct blend of participatory learning and active teaching right so so these are the kinds of abstractions in which the document dabbles blended learning ka definition hi diya gaya hai in sare terms mein apt blend it is an appropriate blend it is an adequate blend so blended learning is a blend that's all that you know from the document right so just as world class institution is world class right so similarly blended learning is a blend that gives you a sense of what we are dealing with here right and i was thinking when i was reading this document this 46 page document it's a it's it's a pain to read that document but of course we have to undergo this pain in order for it to be not inflicted on us right so if we have to if we have to live past this pain if we have to resist this pain then we have to actually undertake the pain of reading that document Right, and that's my request to all of you. Right, so please go out and read this. I was reading it, and I kept thinking that if it's so, a lot of interesting reading, what I could be UGC regulation or UGC guideline. Right, so you could be UGC regulation. Go out and read it. Right, so you will feel that you should read UGC regulation. Right, so you could be 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 UGC regulation. Right, so right so apart from the sheer hollowness of the of the idioms used in the document of the registers used by the document the sheer self referentiality of the entire exercise of defining blended learning apart from that i think there there is another thing that this document does and which is a very very important thing that's right? so what it does is it actually exposes the lie that the nep is nep 2020 kitna bada धोखा था या कितना बड़ा स्कैम था उसको एक्सपोज करने का काम ये डॉक्यूमेंट करता है बहुत ही शानदार तरीके से करता है 
right? So in a way, this document, while trying to hail the NEP, actually goes out and exposes it. Actually, does a complete expose of the of the the scams that the NEP had initiated. Does it do it? Now, so the first thing I think uh, that that uh, the first way in which NEP 2020 is actually exposed by the blended learning concept note is by talking of what we are faced with as education 4.0. Right, so the document says that NEP has already said that we have to education ko diversify karna chahiye. Higher education in this country must be massively overhauled, must be massively reformed, and we must create 21st century learners. Right, so all the usual registers that make zero sense. Right, so you have to learn just learn to understand the kind of policy vocabulary meaninglessness of this policy vocabulary that we are faced with, right? So, so it says that we are out to Im implement something called Education 4.0. Now, what is Education 4.0? There was nothing called Education 4.0 in either the NEP, the final NEP 2020, right? So, or the several revised NEP drafts that we had or the Kasturi Rangan Committee report that we had on the basis of which the NEP was drafted, the final NEP was revised and published. Right, so Education 4.0 ka koi bhi zikra us mein se kisi bhi document mein nahi tha. But jis chiz ka document, jis chiz ka uh, zikra tha, wo tha fourth industrial revolution. NEP mein bar bar karke ye kaha gaya ki higher education ko aaj hum logo ko apne desh mein, right, so is tarikhe ka kabil karwana aur is, is tarikhe se uh, reform karna chahiye taki wo fourth industrial revolution ka harbinger ban pae right so abhi ye fourth industrial revolution se hi aata hai education 4.0 ka concept right so matlab fourth education revolution abhi fourth industrial revolution or fourth education revolution dono hi world economic forum ka term hai right so dono term hi world economic forum se hi ubhar ke aaya hai or World Economic Forum kya hai? World Economic Forum is basically a conglomerate, right? So it is basically a collection of multinational capital, right? So it's a, it's a collection of private multinational companies, right? So it's a confederation of multinational capitalists, right? So who have coined concepts like the fourth industrial revolution, which is a revolution in the field of data mining, and fourth, the education revolution, which is, of course, education imparted through data. So clearly, at the very outset, right, so this document tells you that all the, the tall talk, right, so that the NEP had made about taking Indian education back to the, to the liberal arts, right, so about taking Indian education back to the ancient Sixty-four colors, right? So, so that entire talk about returning education to its liberal destination, returning education to its liberal origins, is actually a lie, right? So that is what this this document clarifies at the very outset by saying that what we are preparing ourselves for is actually the World Economic Forum's imagination of neoliberal progress, right? So that's that's the first point. And, and as you can understand, right, so the fourth industrial revolution in the NEP becomes the fourth education revolution in the blended learning document. So what we are actually talking about is an internal substitution of industry and education. What we're faced with is a project of turning education into industry, right? So the fourth revolution is the same, but what, what changes between the two fourth revolutions that we are talking about, right? So the revolution changes first from industrial capital to educational capital. So what we are dealing with here is an educational industry. So what is this revolution all about? It's about turning education into an industry. Right, and that is what the blended learning document says at the very outset. 
number one. Number two, what the what the blended learning document again proves as a massive lie, and which I think is fantastically well done. Right. So if there is something that this that this document must be congratulated for, it is the way in which its foolishness, its stupidity actually goes on to expose, as I said, the 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 criminal undertones of the NEP. Right. So, so uh, and that is something that that one has to look out for. Right. So uh, there's this uh, section in I'm just going to quote from uh, the concept note on blended learning. And this is page two. Right. So end of the second page. Right. So, and uh, it actually goes out and says, right, so that um, uh, somebody is saying something. Ah, OK. Yeah. So. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, so I'm just quoting from uh, this document, right, so where it actually tries to break or tries to bust the myth of liberal education that was proposed by the NEP by saying that liberal education is actually, and I quote, begin quotes, potpourri or types of course leading to something called a Bachelor of Liberal Education in the event of credits not adding up to a specific discipline. So it says that blended learning right, so is going to actually leave you with a potpourri. Potpourri means a hodgepodge. Leave you with a khichri. Right? So it's going to leave you with a khichri leading to something called a bachelor of liberal education. It calls itself as resulting in a khichri. Imagine is a mix and match of different things, right? And Bachelor of Liberal Education is meant for whom? It is meant for people who do not have their credits adding up to a specific discipline. Jin logo ka credit agar count karke koi specialization tak nahi pahunch raha hai, right? So, jo specialized education tak pahunchne ki shamta nahi rakhte hai, right? So, basically, the potential dropouts of the system are going to end up with liberal education. So, basically, it's reducing the liberal to the status of the vocational. Right. And that is exactly what this document does. And it says that for all those people who cannot move higher up into research education, who specialized education shamta ya sapna dek nahi sakte hai, right? So, jiske paas wo aathik upaye nahi hai, right? So, jinke paas wo social ya intellectual mobility ka zariya nahi hai, unke liye kya hai? Unke liye ek pot puri hai. उनके लिए खिचड़ी, राइट और उस उस खिचड़ी का नाम है बैचलर ऑफ लिबरल एजुकेशन, राइट मतलब लिबरल एजुकेशन इस व्हाट यू एंड अप विथ इफ यू डोंट राइज अप द लैडर इनटू बिकमिंग लेट्स से पार्ट ऑफ इंडस्ट्रियल मैनेजमेंट सिस्टम्स, राइट इफ यू कैन वॉक अप टू अ रिसर्च प्रोग्राम इफ you are neither entitled for social mobility nor intellectual mobility, but mere citizenly behavior. Aapko kya diya jayega? Aapko kuch civic behavior sikhaya jayega. Right? So, utna leke aap nikal jayega. Right? Abhi is civic behavior kya cheez hai? Right? So, yeh mene shuru se hi bolne ka koshish kiya tha ki yeh jo Kasturi Rangan Committee report se ubhar ke jo aya hai naya education policy 2020 usme achanak se ek 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 chalang lagaya gaya hai right? So, from the neoliberal manifesto for higher education to a liberal order of higher education or sare log sochne lage ki aray baap re right? So, fascist government take right? So, BJP aake liberal education ta baat kar raha hai yeh to bhaot bariya cheez hai right? So, पर उसी टाइम पे हम लोग सोचने की कोशिश कर रहे थे कि ये जो लिबरल एजुकेशन है ये किस तरीके का सिटीजनशिप ट्रेनिंग देगा सिटीजनशिप ट्रेनिंग देगा दैट इज गोइंग टू बी इन लाइन विथ द सिटीजनशिप अमेंडमेंट एक्ट राइट इट इज गोइंग टू ट्रेन पीपल हु आर नॉट मेन फॉर सोशल इकोनॉमिक और इंटेलेक्चुअल मोबिलिटी इन टू अटन इमेजिनेशन ऑफ सिटीजनशिप दैट इज कम टू अस फ्रॉम दी और दीए Right, so it will train those people. Right, so it will train the dropouts of the higher education system into a certain kind of communal idea of citizenship. That is something that therefore becomes the actual intention of this liberal manifesto. This is what 
right? So this this blended learning document actually clarifies where it says that the liber, the Bachelor of Liberal Education, which has been sung these massive paeans too, right? So which has been hailed as the as the raison d'etre, right? So, as the only retooling higher education in India, right? So is actually only a byproduct. Right, so is actually meant for the people who go, can't go higher up. Right, go for specialized training. They will end up with liberal education. And what kind of liberal education? It is basically a certain training into civic behavior. A certain kind of civic imagination. Kind of civic imagination that is legislated within the parliament will be given legitimacy through as common sense within the educational institution. Right? So higher education institution ka kaam hoga, wo legislative dharana of citizenship ko, nagarik ta ko, right? So ek common sense ke level pe, civic behavior be translated. Or us hisaab se liberal education, bachelor of liberal education, diya jayega logo ko, ye baat blended learning document se khul ke uphar ke aage hai. Right? So, or, so that is why I'm saying that, uh, Crime exposes the other scene of crime, right? So, so um, and and that is what what has happened with this document, right? So, so the blended learning document has actually exposed the under the the underpinnings of of the the NEP twenty twenty, right? So the third thing that that again um, is done by way of complicating the entire uh, rationale of the NEP, right? So by way of calling out the NEP, I think the the BL document calls out the NEP document, right? So is where the again, right, so the NEP's claim to liberalize education is claim to try and come up with an emancipatory order of liberal education is again completely busted as a lie insofar as the whole blended learning document, right, so on the one hand says that it is a tribute to the NEP, right, so on the one hand it constantly says ki NEP ko man ke hum log ye bol rahe. NEP ne jo baat kaha hai, usi ka hum, ha, uh, uh, usi ko hum dora rahe hai, right? So, usi ko maan ke hum aage barne ki koshish kar rahe hai. Right? So, NEP ne jis vocabulary ko bhoat shandar tarike se apna jo ambit tha, usse bahar rakha tha, wo tha ek neoliberal vocabulary. Right? So, jaha pe NEP ne kaha tha ki Ministry of Human Resource Development ko change karke hum loko Ministry of Education bana dena chahi. Right, so, we need liberal arts to right? so, technical, professional, right? so, uh, vocational, all courses, ke, uh, uh, degree programs, mein aap log, ha, liberal education, liberal arts, humanities or social sciences. Right? So, this is the neoliberal character of education, higher education, ka jo neoliberal registers, which is the way that NEP has done it, it has done it with this BL document. Right, so jaha pe iska vocabulary cheek uska ulta. Ek taraf bol raha hai ki hum NEP ke jo dikhaye huye raaste hai, NEP ka jo dikhaya hua, NEP hum logo ka patho pradarshak hai, aur usi raaste mein hum logo chalne ki koshish kar hai. Aur dusri taraf it talks about learning as creative product. It talks about stages, it talks about different years, right? So it talks about the different years of an undergrad program, right? Which would mean the 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 stages of an undergrad program, of an academic program, as operations levels. Right? So imagine and borrowed from the IT sector, right? So borrowed from the telecommunication communications industry. About creative product, right? So as producing creative products, right? So as leading to creative products. So learning is nothing but a product, creative product. Right? So it talks about the different stages of learning as operations levels. It talks about teachers as no longer teaching but as facilitating facilitators. It talks about learning having having to become learner centric, right? So again, right? So client based, right? So uh, rational, right? So for retooling education. So it uses the exact neoliberal manifesto about what it claims is a tribute to the NEP, right? So that is largely uh, <clears throat> the first point that I wanted to make. Now, uh, quickly, I will take you through the remaining four points that, that I, right? So I will then hope that there will be some questions that can come up. Uh, am I being uh, 
am I being understandable? Are people getting me or am I going too fast or is my English a little too fast? Shambhavi, do you think this is working? Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so, uh, the second point that I, yeah, okay, thank you. Right, so the second point that I wanted to make is uh, that now, ye jo phir blended learning ka ye jo ek document hum logo ko diya gaya hai, jiska mool uddeshya bhi clear ho gaya hai, usko document ko parni se hi ho jayega. Right, so, aur uska jo andruni jo, jo, uh, jo, jo hollowness hai, wo bhi aapko dekhna shuru ho jayega as soon as you read this document. Now, how does one counter, right? So how does one counter this kind of an attempt at ramming in uh, a set of policy goals which are inherently discriminatory, which are going to, again, as we've already said, right, which are going to only create further handicaps, right? So do what it calls in, let's say, policy vocabulary, educational delivery. Resist this move. Right? Now, the, the most staple strategy that has been used to resist this move is to use the card of access, the, the unequal access line of argument, right? And which is a very, very valid argument. But I think that as an argument, this alone will not work anymore that we cannot counter a move towards online education merely through access arithmetic. Because it is access arithmetic again, it is enrollment statistics again, that will be repeatedly used by the government in order to ram in something like this. And what do I mean by that? Right, so uh, now, that what we talk about in terms of digital divide and which is an absolute reality in our lives and we know that digital when we speak of the digital divide we are talking about uh, differential access we are talking about differences in technological entitlements and technological access uh, across different castes different classes different uh, uh, genders, right, so across different communities, religions, and regions, right, so it is on the basis of these parameters, right, so that there are stark differences between technological, uh, within, within uh, uh, let's say, degrees of technological access and degrees of technological entitlement or technological know-how, and this is an absolute reality. When the government tries to bring in online learning, it will precisely use the access card. Right, so the reason why it will do it is because it has already foisted this entire imagination of online education on the effigy of traditional learning, on the effigy of right of the of the traditional physical brick and mortar university, which it says has not been able to stop. And after so many years of traditional British and not university education, the GER reports, right, so the enrollment ratio in higher education is only 26.3, which means one fourth of the college going country can actually access higher education. So already set up of traditional university education. It has already set up an effigy of public funded university education by saying that look at what public funded uh, traditional physical brick and mortar education has been able to do all, in all these years. Look at what universities have been able to achieve. Right, so it has neither been able to increase enrollment, able to substantively bring about any kind of social justice. Right, so in so far as uh, uh, reservation policies are there, but still seats are not being filled. Right, so there are there is an unwieldy number of institutions to which, uh, as per the latest government report, would be around fifty-two thousand. Right, so at despite the huge number of institutions, the number of students enrolled within this institution is only about one fourth of the total population in this age bracket. Right, so the government has already created right so something called a monster. And this monster is traditional public university education. And it has said that, look at 
the kind of people who are coming out of the traditional public university again. Right. So those are the people who shout slogans. Right. So which are anti-India. Those are the slogans who shout. Uh, those are the people who shout, shout anti-national. Uh, 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 let's say inflammatory slogans. Right. So they are the seditious population. So so we are investing in education in the public sector. Right. But it is not being able to give us any kind of dividend. Instead, what we are actually producing are all these immoral. Right. So anti-national traitors. So we have to try and find a resolution. And as a resolution to that, right, so the government proposes education. Now, the thing that we have to remember is that when the government is proposing online educational solutions, right, so as a substitute for physical university infrastructures, it is very easy for the government to provide is or data doles to everybody who enrolls for an online course as almost an incentive. No longer having to invest in the physical infrastructures of a brick and mortar institution. You don't have to keep up a university anymore. Right? So you don't, and, and this is clear in the in a in a set of regulations that came out in 2020, which nobody actually noticed in September 2020, there was a set of regulations that were brought out by the UGC, right, and which was called the, the open and distance learning and online learning regulations, online learning programs regulations. And extra for me, key physical infrastructure ke zariye, Koi bhi center for online education ka koi bhi minimum requirement nahi hai. Or distance learning karwana hai, to aapka minimum requirement hai of physical infrastructure 15,000 square feet. But if you are trying to open a, a center for online education, then you don't even have a minimum physical infrastructural requirement. You can set up a center for online education in any one room find. Right? So go out and find any place and you can set up a shop there for online education. And it clearly sets that out. Right? So therefore, if the if the government ha no longer has to, right, so if the government no longer has to really fund physical infrastructures of imparting education, it saves a tremendous amount of money. If it doesn't have to pay for electricity, for water, for basic stationery, for all that, that keeps a university running. And also the other non-intellectual sectors of work that a university creates, which actually reproduces the university. The university is not only a site of intellectual production. What keeps those conditions of intellectual pr production alive? Conditions of intellectual production are kept in place by different sectors of non-intellectual labor. You have to fund any of that those forms of labor, right? And now all the money that we have been saving since the time of the pandemic can thereafter be used in giving data packs to people. And given the, the government that we have, which actually works as the frontal agent of private capital, if you look at the blended learning document, you will realize that it is actually an agency document for private licensed software, additional technology capital. Right, so all the licensed software, right, so licensed learning management systems, LMS, right, so that it names, are privately purchased. Clearly, blended learning is being planned as a public private partnership scheme. Right? And in a country and faced with a situation, faced with the recent past. Right, so the history of the recent past in India, we know that we have a state which works at the behest of public cap uh, private capital. If, if there is a, there is a, if if in a country, right, so uh, an institute which is yet to come out, which is in, yet to happen, an institute which is yet to be set up, right, so can be given an institute of eminence tag, then obviously, right, so that same company will go out and give data packs to people if the government can enroll people for uh, its tech, ed tech solutions. Right, so if pollution providers can make a profit out of it, and they can make huge profits out of the sector, right? As Shanghadi has already pointed out, and as the government's own data would report, right? So 
73.7%, right? So close to 74% of the country's population of the college going age are still outside of the formal educational sector, which is 105 million people. If out of 105 million people, you can at least tap 40 million or 50 million people, right? So through these online remote distance format, uh, formats of courses, right? So you have a massive profit to be part, right? And it's going to be very easy for the government to therefore give out doles of private data, data packages to people. And that's exactly what, what happens, right? So, so access data is something that one cannot merely speak of. And which brings me to my third point. So therefore, what does one have to look at? Right, so in resisting this blended learning kind of move, what does one look at? One has to look at, in my understanding, number one, the policy intentions. What are the policy developments that have led to this kind of a move? And number two, right, so if we are being told that this is by the force of global example, USA to if we are given the American example or the Australian example, if we are asked to take on blended learning by the sheer force of global examples, then we have to actually dig out global evidence, globally collected evidence, and throw it back at them and say that this is how those projects have failed in the same economies that you are talking about. Just give you some data here, right, for you to understand how this policy move has been prepared for, right, so it has been prepared for not just with the NEP, but way before the NEP, actually five years before the NEP came out, there is something called the CBCS, which all of you would be aware of, right, so the choice-based credit system, which was brought in as a one-size-fits-all uniform template of syllabus, which is going to be taught to all institutions across the country. One of the reasons why CBCS was brought in is to actually uniformize, is to actually standardize curriculum in such a way so that you can courses, so that you can introduce digital courses which can then be consumed by populations across all institutions in the country. This was brought in precisely with the explicit agenda of making possible something called the credit transfer. Because CBCS, after that, right, you all know that if you do the CBCS, you have to do the uniform syllabus. Now, the uniform syllabus means that students are uniform. They are coming with their own histories of disprivilege, their own structural histories of disprivilege and injustice there being a uniform syllabus, you cannot have uniform learning outcomes, as they call it. They are trying to bring in, they are trying to retune the CBCS syllabus through something called the LOC, learning outcome based curricular framework, etc. CBCS was actually brought in explicit things in intention of making credit transfer costs and that credit transfer costs to become a means of offering on courses as a two at the same time and thus make way for a massive curtailment of the number of institutions. Massively cut down on the costs of keeping up the physical infrastructures of higher education was what was planned in the name of a uniform syllabus. And this is the kind of shati pati that we have to be. But we have to be very, very alert to how policy decisions are brought in in the name of syllabus. Right, so these options don't come within settings, right? So where students come from 
right? So, uh, based of of absolute disprivilege, right? So you cannot have the same syllabus in, uh, let's say, Saint Stephen's College and Sundarban Desi Hazrat College. Have the same syllabus in the Hindu College as well as in Papal Putima College. You cannot. That became clear soon after the CBCS came in, right? Around 2015, it was in 2015 that the CBCS was rammed in again with an underlying intention of digitizing content, using means of disseminating content across the country. Soon after, how does this become clear that the CBCS was actually a ploy of digitizing higher education? This becomes clear because in 2016, the UGC comes up with a set of regulations, right, so, um, called the SWAM regulations, right, so, which is again about introducing online component within higher educational institutions through the approval of academic councils. And it says that if a particular institution doesn't have faculty strength, a particular institution doesn't have teachers enough to papers. Elective papers ka panda hi aya, right, so CBCS ke zariye. Aur uske baat regulation aapke bol raha hai ki aapke paas agar teaching strength nahi hai, elective papers offer karne kya, to aap kya kar sakte hai? Aap MOOC offer kar sakte You can, you can basically digitize a portion of your curriculum up to a maximum of 20%. 20%. Right, so in 2016 it was 20 percent right so so the rate of inf inflation right so doubles in uh, the rate of online inflation doubles in four years as you can understand so so you can you can digitize a 20 percent of your curriculum if you do not have teaching strength if you don't have faculty members to teach those courses and you can do this with elective papers right so at that's at that moment of time right so we realize that what the government is saying that you can go out and digitize all those courses that involve cross university enrollments matlab all those papers which are being taught as accs and sccs the ability enhancement courses and the skill enhancement courses right so all those papers that involve students from all colleges under a university and therefore require larger classroom sizes require more teachers require more maintenance staff and therefore more infrastructural facilities can be safely digitized in order to save on this happened in 2016. Thereafter, the Kasturi Rangan Committee report got submitted in end 2018, was published in 2019, right, so soon after the second Modi government came to power. Right, so I'll take about um, 10 more minutes. Is that okay, Shambhavi? Uh, yeah, sure. 10 minutes is fine. Okay. So soon after that, uh, the Kasturi Rangan Committee report, which became the basis for the new NEP, right, so came up and it said that the purpose of the new national education policy should be to double gross enrollment ratio, right, so the purpose should be to, to double enrollments, while at the same time to curtail the number of institutions to one fourth of its current size. Right, so, and the, the NEP, make, the, the Kasturi Rangan Committee report goes on to give you the exact arithmetic of this. Numbers are laid bare. Right, so the Kasturi Rangan Committee report actually goes out and says that we will have to increase the GER in the country, the GER for higher education from 26.3 to 50, which means you have to what it is. And on the other hand, we have to reduce the number of institutions in the country to 12,300 a maximum of 12,300 from its current size of 52,000. Which means what are you doing? You are reducing the number of institutions to a quarter of its current strength. From 52,000 to 12,300 across all three types. Right? And yet you are talking of increasing the number of enrollments. Now, how is that to be possible? How do you think that could be made possible if not through mass digitization of higher education? This arithmetic was basically nothing but a numerical sleight of hand, right? And a numerical sleight of hand that could have only been made possible through mass online transitioning of higher education. 
right? And soon after that, uh, there was the UGC regulations on online learning programs in 2020, right? So which again went out and said that online learning centers, as I had said, right, so which were called COE, Centers for Online Education, can be set up without any kind of physical infrastructure. While the technical staffing requirements were divided into eight grades, grades of technical staff that one requires in order to set up a COE, a Center for Online Education. But you don't need any physical infrastructure. All you need is technical solution providers, right? So what you basically are doing is you are reducing the entire higher education to a KPO model, right? So this is the KPOization, right? So, or what one can call the knowledge process outsourcing model, right? So of transforming education into industry. Education 4.0. That is what education 4.0 means, right? So, and uh, and finally comes the blend, blended learning concept note, which actually goes out and builds on the NEP suggestion, right? So which came from the Kasturi Rangan Committee report, which actually says that uh, uh, following the Kasturi Rangan Committee report, right? So we again uh, would have as a minimum requirement one uh, uh, technical support center, right? So for every 10 institutions. So this again works in tandem with the idea of the college complex, right? So the, the Kasturi Rangan Committee report had been very clear when it said that how do we bring down the number of institutions by creating college complexes, by merging colleges and higher education institutions. What the BL document, the blended learning document, also builds on by saying that 10 institutions can have one online support center. Minimum requirement that one now, there is a lot of further arithmetic that gets accurately confirmed by uh, the BL document, right? So how the BL document actually fulfills all the prophecies. Uh, committee report, where the Kasturi Rangan Committee report talks of curtailing the number of institutions by nearly three-fourths, right? So what you have in the BL document is, again, right, so curtailing the... the, the component of face-to-face -face education by, as you say, right, so as, as uh, you've seen, right, by about 70%. That is the desired outcome, right? So the blended learning document says that a minimum of 40% must be transitioned online and a maximum of 70% can be delivered online, right? So 70% of institutions will be redundant. Right, in the process, right? And of course, um, that is what we shall see, right? And that is something that has already been put in place, right? So, uh, by something called uh, a, a multidisciplinary curricular program that has been published by the Delhi University already, right? So, where um, these basic right, so value courses, value added courses, right? So, like ethics and culture, right, so like social and emotional learning, right, so the credits for which will add up to about 88 credits out of a 196 credit course, which means 45% of the course, common courses that are to be taught across all disciplines. So if you just digitize these AECCs, the VACs, and the SECs, automatically you will fulfill the UGC's VL document. Now, what happened in the US? So this is where I, I said, right? So now we have to learn from global precedent, as I said, right? So now in the US, which is, which is the example that is constantly cited to us, right? So uh, this entire MOOC wave happened right after the global recession of 2008. And the MOOC years were 2011 to 2016, right? So and uh, what happened in the US is something, something, um, that we really need to take note of. And that is exactly what we are also going to envision at the future of higher education if blended learning becomes the order of the day. Now in the US, right, so there were all these MOOCs, these online courses, these completely fully online programs, and some of which were also the C MOOCs, which would be the collaborative MOOCs, right? So, so C MOOC and MOOC programs, right, so which were, with 8,700 students as their initial enrollment, right? Now, that is the number of initial enlargement of enrollments that you will see here, and which is why I'm saying access arithmetic would not work at the first go, 
right? What we have to talk about is, as Collective has very rightly done, dropouts, right? So just enrollments wouldn't work. Be a massive enlarging, right? So a massive bolstering of the number of enrollments with the bringing, with the with the coming in of online courses, right? So because all the adult male working populations to enroll in physical university spaces will also get a taste of university education through online courses. But how long will they continue? And that is where the U.S. example can become instructive, where courses with 8,700 enrollments finally end up with 3,358 students, right, so at the beginning of the third year. 60% of the number of students enrolled in an online course actually dropping out within two years of the start of the course. And that is what happens. And from, from the US, if you use the data published by US reports on online education, you will realize that with the coming of online education and with the coming of MOOCs, what happened in the US was that completion rates, rates of undergraduate flow brought down to one fourth of community college rates and the completion rates in online programs were one-eighth of regular campus college rates. So that is the level of dropouts that we will have. And all these dropouts are going to be finally invisibilized. Right? So, so this blended learning model is one of the means of institutionalizing and invisibilizing dropout. How? Through what they have called the multiple exit point model. Right, so where, oh, you want to drop out, you can't carry on anymore, right? So because you do not have the tenacity, you do not have the social capital or the or the finances or the or the academic rigor to continue with the course. Okay, you will get a certificate program. You will get a diploma program. So you have a means of analyzing dropouts and therefore invisibilizing it. Right? So none of these dropouts will be accounted for as dropouts anymore. And yet there's going to be a massive evacuation of student populations from within the university sector. Now, just uh, one or two more minutes right, to where I just touch upon the fourth and the fifth point. The fourth point is where um, I, I can talk about this in the question answer session if there are people who want to ask any questions. Right. So, so but if you if you look at the BL document, you will realize that there's one thing that has been completely delegitimized by this model of the of blended learning, which is teaching itself. It goes on to say that teacher lectures must be substituted by video recordings. It says that the maximum amount of lectures that can happen in any course would be 40% of the total course content. Even within the online component in a course, the maximum lectures that can be given would amount to 50% of the total online component. So you have a desirable um, total, a desirable quantum of 70% already reserved for online teaching. Out of that 70%, you can only have 50% of lecturing. And in the remaining face-to-face -face teaching as well, Right, so you can only have up to a maximum of 40%. So overall, the course must have a maximum of percent of lecture-based classroom face-to-face -face teaching. And that is something that the blended learning document is very, very clear about. And what it basically therefore wants to go out and do to the teachers as a workforce is that they want to reduce teaching to a service industry. Actually, right, create a certain kind of precariat, right? So they want to reduce the teaching, the, the, the teacher, right, so to a certain technological service provider, right? So where the teachers must merely work as tech solution experts, right? So it is the entire telecommunications industry which will take over the teaching sector, right? So, and teachers must only work as informal care workers. Right, and that is how you will have the ad hocs and the guests right, being reduced into informal care workers. They must merely work as solution providers, facilitators, very, very clearly coded into the document. Right, so they must only be technical support staff. 
these are our questions that we have to again. So what is the future of teaching work? is again something that we have to ask, not only for teachers who are currently working as adjuncts or ad hocs or guest lecturers within the system, but also be graduating out of the system. What kind of academic jobs will be left for those come out of this higher education system? The final point, right, so with which I will end my, my talk talk, right, and then, then we can have a conversation, is that alternative paradigm of higher education that is being brought in by blended learning model and that alternative paradigm is very articulately expressed right so it's very very accurately articulated right so bohot hi shandar tarike se usko articulate kiya gaya hai ek and that phrase becomes a running refrain through the entire 46-page document. And what is that phrase? That is called the Academic Bank of Credit, ABC. The student will have a certain credit bank. Not only is the use of terms like bank and credit important, but I want to argue, and we can talk more about this if there are questions, but I want to argue what we are moving towards is a certain kind of a creditor and a debtor relationship. Where the student must necessarily be made into a debtor of the state. Right, so of the nation and the market and who must only repay her debt to the state and the market by selling her labor power for cheap. And that is made possible through all of this academic bank of credit, the multiple exit options, the multidisciplinary educational model. Right, so, so all of this is one way of creating semi-skilled, cheap, informal labor for the market, which is how right, so every student must pay off, must repay the debt that she or he has incurred through higher education. Right, so it's like a primordial debt, as, as Dave Graeber would call it. Right, and this is a movement towards a stock market model education, where finally what you are faced with is a certain kind of debt token. Right, so what you get as your certificate or your diploma or your degree is actually a debt token. Finally, pay your debt through by selling your labor for cheap. Okay, so this is the alternative paradigm. Get into in greater detail, but I'm I'm ending it here, and perhaps we could have more questions coming. And um, yeah, okay. Thank you, thank you for that uh, interesting presentation. Uh, I think for a lot of us, uh, reading the NEP and this uh, following document as well have has been an exercise in kind of uh, detangling what is being said through terms that we would actually adopt ourselves, like autonomy in education, uh, flexibility, multidisciplinary education. All these things are not uh, like notions or ideas that we are fundamentally in disagreement with, but when you read, you actually and read alongside real changes that we are seeing in our political and social lives. It's only then that the real meaning of what is happening in education can actually be understood, which is something I think you've brought out really well. Some uh, things have been mentioned in the comment box as well. Uh, actually writing that, uh, and this is something we've also been uh, talking about since, I think, uh, conversation around online education began in April last year that it's actually in the name of uh, increasing enrollment like you rightly pointed out that these changes will be shot out so it's not so easy to say that uh, this cannot be the only point of opposing something like online education uh, but Shari is asking that uh, it is about time that we start talking about alternatives without being anti-technology. What can digital educational aids look like when they supplement a vision of liberation and social justice instead of substituting it? Perhaps we could begin with that. I had a few 
uh, questions of my own but i think we can go on to that later okay yeah. okay uh, uh, can take your questions as well and then address them because I, i'll note them down and i think i mean uh, i can take a cluster of questions and try answering them as well yeah uh no i think uh, for me it was also like when you point out that in the us also like it's after the recession right that in a lot you know, this kind of mooc system of education is being implemented this thing like the past few years have been pandemic it's been a period of unprecedented economic crisis the state of employment has a uh, bad in our con- uh, context and like things hidden within this fourth industrial revolution what is the actual state of employment things like the gig economy which is being spoken of everywhere but what does it actually mean so how does that tie to something like a certificate courses say vocational courses or this the kind of modularization of education where you have like you said like 40 to 50% of the course is basically i mean it's i don't know what these courses even the content of the courses is basically less uh and you us and we know what it will be like in the experience of du itself through fyup cbcs we have seen what actually has happened in the name of multidisciplinary education where it's actually for the purpose of creating a uh, cheap labor like you right rightly pointed out so i was wondering if that connection can be uh, further explored uh about parallel like in terms of the moments at which decisions have been arrived at comparing the US and Indian case. Yeah. Absolutely. So I will just first try and um, answer or try attempting to answer the question. I think that's a, that's a fantastic question and that's something that we actually tried thinking about. Now, uh, Uh, as as we were in of the program right before we actually went live right so, uh, we have to acknowledge our own failures as well and there are certain kinds of imaginative failures that we have also faced with right so as a teaching community right so we have faced to we have failed to actually come up with an alternative imagination of teaching in the pandemic or teaching through the pandemic can there be some form of uh, an alternative imagination right so of education during the pandemic right so we we just failed to perform this in imaginative task and as soon as the pandemic came on and uh, physical spaces had to be shut down right so what became of paramount importance for teachers across the country is to try and justify their salaries and it became an entire sincerity complex driven kind of uh, debate all along um, it was there there were two kinds of uh, let's say uh, there are there were two kinds of drives within the debate one was let us go out and teach in whichever model we can right which is a damage control kind of uh, mode of working right so let us try and control the damage in whichever way we can let us try and put in our bit right so let us try and teach and at least justify the payments that we are getting how the institution to account our lives and our careers right so, so so it was basically falling into the same trap that the institution had laid out for us and this was not a new trap the pandemic only sealed it by uh, the logic of fate right so the pandemic only helped the government's policy decisions carry right so almost the force of fate and destiny this was something that we have already seen and that that we have just spoken about that so this was something that was from 2015 onwards right the pandemic merely sealed it right and gave it a certain kind of fatalism <clears throat> so that was one part of the narrative right so that was one way in which teachers responded to the crisis by saying that oh we'll have to make do and and prove our sincerity and sincerity always as much as we try and posit it as an ethical choice it is always a moral act there cannot be a politics to sincerity sincerity is basically about maintaining status quo right so it is about basically shying away from questioning why things are the way they are 
you comply, right? The moment you try and get into the sincerity mode, you are already sending out a message of obedience and compliance. Right? And that is what we had internalized sincerity as moral choice. Right? And that became a problem, number one. Right? So number two, the other kind of uh, debate that that um, that same time and that has become even more shrill at this point of time when it has become right so almost uh, a lot more uncertain about when we are going to be able to open colleges and educational institutions right so now faced with the kind of an uncertainty right so there that that part of the debate has become even stronger and what was that part of the debate oh we have to keep the conversations good it was basically a certain kind of a liberal exhilaration Academics is nothing but the adventure of ideas, and we have to keep the ideas flowing. All, all these uh, people from within the teaching community, right, who thought that, oh, keeping up with online teaching was just about keeping up the adventure, keeping the adventure of intellectuality alive. Now, we have to understand that academics is not the kick or the thrill of an adventure, right? So academics has certain concerns related to it, concerns of the people who come with histories and who want to build histories. What histories can you, right? So there are histories that they come with and there are histories that they want to become part of. To realize that before we go out and speak this 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 liberal congratulatory rhetoric right of academic excitement of mere intellectual disinterestedness right so, so became a problem and we have to understand if we have to try and think about the public policy around higher education merely talk about the present we have to ensure that the future of the sector is going to be kept as, as free from prejudices as we can as we can make it. Right? So that the future of the sector cannot get worse than it already is. That is what the task of public policy is. The task of public policy is not about tidying over the crisis of the present. It's about being able to think about the future, the sector. Now, what are the conditions of work that we are creating in the field? Right. So, are we merely talking about teacher as right? So, and that that was pretty much what the debate was all about, right? So, it's about making the teacher become the adventurer of ideas. But the teacher is not an adventurer of ideas. The teacher is also a worker. Create congenial conditions of work for the teacher. Right, so in a situation where 70% of the country's institutions might actually be forced to disappear. So until the time we start thinking about conditions of work and conditions of intellectual work, which is where students and teachers as flesh and blood teachers are actually cannot think of an alternative public policy. Now, which is where <clears throat> I think Shorya's question, I haven't taken Shorya's question head on yet. And I do have, I think uh, this is one kind of exercise that, that at least some of us have been trying to do since the beginning. It's only that by now, one and a half years into the pandemic, right? So it seems it has become even more difficult to have this conversation with people. If we are now going to tell them that, oh, listen, this online teaching is really, really discriminatory. People just brush aside the entire debate by saying, what else do you have at hand? Now, the thing is, we really had a lot to do. At the beginning of the pandemic, we had decided to try and transfer, right? So our intellectual work, in which was more related to the community, and I was thinking that why couldn't we, at that point of time, ask students from all disciplines and all professional and technical institutions to use their course, let's say course content, all the course content that they would have learned in all these years, to 
try imaginary templates for how to override the pandemic, of how to, let's say, work out a viable model of allaying the crisis. Right? So how could doctors, engineers, right? so architects think of working with a pandemic situation? Right? So how could we, and that would have been a real project-based learning exercise. Just allowed students from different sectors and these could have been group projects, could have been a project-based learning environment. The stuff that the blended learning thing about is something that we could have actually made possible in imaginative terms. Why could we not have, at that point of time, when schools were all shut down, why could we not have university students try and run night schools in certain ways, right? So through certain kinds of community radio, uh, in, uh, let's say installations, right? So why could we not have used these kinds of modes, right? So why could we not have used community radio stations, right? So to conduct night schools with students of migrant workers at that point of time, and would that not have accounted as term paper weight of worth of credit load? have asked architects to think of ways of imagining a nation's physical infrastructure, a nation's, let's say, urban planning, right? So such that, right, so much of social distancing can be lived away from, right? So, so that, right, so untouchability does not become the norm of everyday social existence. Could we not have allowed free reign to the imagination of students and allowed them to work on projects? And these projects would could thereafter have become part of a repository, actually become part of a repository that the state could have worked with. I mean, these were ways in which the university could have actually connected with communities outside of it, could have entered into a dialogue with the life that it excludes, as well as the life that goes out and represses it, right? So the institutions that go out and repress the university, also dialogues that could have uh, perhaps been made possible through these alternative imaginative projects, right? So that teachers and students could have worked on together, right? So uh, and and uh, there are there are a lot of other things that that uh, we have point of time, right? So. <clears throat> uh, Okay, now to, to enter into Shambhavi's question quickly again, right, so yes, and that is again, right, so the question of employment or rather the question of unemployment, right, so now the reason why the NEP makes a pitch for a shift to liberal education, liberal model of, of uh, higher educational reform that has been driving nearly three decades of educational planning in the country. Right, so why would a three decade old model suddenly be overturned by a fascist government, right, so which has gone out and actually, right, so bombed stills, right, so with stun grenades, right? So why would they talk about, about liberal education? Now, the reason why it did liberal education was precisely because they were already faced with a complete loss of the economic justification narrative. Right, so that there were people coming out of the higher education sector, right, with no possibility of landing a job. Absolutely clear from the government's own data, stuff that people work with. Right, so for example, if you place the the uh, All India Survey of Higher Education report, right, so 2017-18, the latest report was published in 2018-19, right, so published in 2019 of the period 2018-19, but because we are comparing it with the Periodic Labor Force Survey, which was last published in 2017-18, so if we look at the AIESHE data 2017-18, it against the PLS FS data, right? So the, the periodic labor force survey data from 2017-18, we would see that out of male students coming out of Indian higher education, 18 remain unemployed. Government's own data. Right? So 18 out of 26 male students are 
even informal, you even get informal job opportunities, informal contracts, right? And with the case of women, it's every 20 out of 25 women in the Indian higher education sector who end up being completely unemployed, even informally. As for the government's own data, right? So again, labor bureau surveys, if you look at, you will realize that we have thrice the amount of skills in the market, formally trained skills in the market, than we have jobs. Have only, and again, right? So this is from the labor bureau survey data, right? So which says that about 5.4 to 6.8% of the population entering into the job market have formal skill training, have earned some kind of formal skill training, right? So while the percentage of population uh, absorbed within the formal economy is only about 2%, right? So, so you have thrice the number of skills available in the market than you have formal jobs. So that is the state of the economy. And faced with the state of the economy, faced with a situation where there are no jobs, but you have people coming out of the higher education sector with degrees and more degrees and yet more degrees, what do you do? Right? So either you have to turn them into immigrants and which is why you bring in NRCs and CAs, you have to deprive them of all kinds of civic rights and, and, and uh, basic human rights and benefits, deprive them of civil and political liberties by calling them and turning them into illegal migrants, or you do what? You train them into a certain kind of civic behavior only learn to identify the other and turn those others into, uh, um, let's say, potential immigrants, right? Where they can only direct their anger against the market, against in the line for a job, right? So where you can direct your economic anxiety completely different direction, right? So in, in a cultural direction where all your cultural angst will take the place of your economic anxieties. So that was that was primarily the agenda and multidisciplinarity just works absolutely well with this, right? So, and let us not make the mistake, this is stuff that we, we were constantly talking about soon after the NEP came about and people were saying, people were singing all these PNs to interdisciplinary education. Let us be very clear that multidisciplinarity is not the same as interdisciplinarity. Disciplinary education was the same as interdisciplinary education, then there wouldn't have been a policy document which does not say a single word about the Centers for Women's Studies, about the Centers for Studies in Social Exclusion and Inclusive Policy, about the Centers for Studies in Human Rights, which are being routinely shut down in the country, or which are being routinely threatened with closure in the country. Not a single line is spared for them departments or the social exclusion studies departments. Now, what is meant to multidisciplinary education? Multidisciplinary education and, and Delhi University has already come up with a template for it. Please, right, so let us understand the gravity of this, right? So Delhi University had constituted something called uh, an NEP implementation committee. Right, so NEP but implementation committee university Right, so the Delhi University set up something called an NEP implementation committee, which had 14 meetings from October to February. Right, so and they came up with a model template for multidisciplinary education. Multidisciplinary education, it is nothing but a complete rehash of the four-year undergraduate program, where you will have all these value-added courses in the name of multidisciplinarity, which will teach you a little bit of mathematics, a little bit of data analysis, a little bit of entrepreneurial economics, a little bit of culture and ethics, and a little bit of social and emotional learning. All of this. Will you be able to read Ranojit Puro? Not at all. 
able to do women's studies? Not at all. In a little bit of social science and a little bit of literature and a little bit of history will you to do women's studies. Right? And that is what. So you will be given all these basic diluted skill quantum, right? So all cognitive skills through which you can thereafter only move from one job to another as both the store manager as well as the billing clerk. Right? So you can double up as both the physics teacher as well as the physical infrastructure. Physically, uh, the PT teacher, the physical training instructor. Right? So you will be in charge of the gardening activities in a college as well as do a little bit of Sanskrit teaching. So you are basically made into a multitasking labor force. Multidisciplinary education prepares you. It prepares you for a multitasking order of labor. Nothing but as you said, right? So cheap, semi-skilled, informal labor. Thanks. We have a few more questions. Actually, quite a few more questions uh, okay. in the comment box. I think, yeah, we can go chronologically. First, uh, Jilly asks, the platforms like Coursera and Edits have been offering online reputed like universities internationally for a long time. But I think that in the Indian context, the learner needs uh, infrastructure, like physical infrastructure, classroom, library, and such other facilities. So, to frame that question, like how exactly is it possible then to have online courses? actually reproduce these conditions of learning which are required for the kind of education we imagine or right. going back to the question of like what kind of courses are actually being taught like uh, to the question of infrastructure and uh, I think parts of which you've already addressed in right. your presentation hmm. I think uh, one more question right. or, yeah. I guess two more questions, but the other two are sort of linked. Uh, so, Johanna asks uh, via FB, uh, can we also see this as a means to create brainwash neo-Hitler youth, if he may, in schools? Uh, basically, the right thing saying, catch them young. The uh, second question is that, how do we then see this in terms of, is it an attack on the spaces that schools and colleges create for intellectual exchange among students and uh, between students and teachers? Okay. Uh, thank you again. Right. So, so uh, I will take both these questions or both these sets of questions together. Right. So, Jeannie, I uh, I agree with what you're saying. Right. So, so uh, of course, right. So, the, the successful online courses that are being run by um, Coursera, right. And these are all uh, actually Silicon Valley, right. So, uh, in, in inventions, right. So, Coursera, edX, right. So, from reputed universities. And uh, these are things that, that, that actually there's a lot of work on uh, the Coursera and the edX debacles, right, so in the U.S., right? So um, what has come to us today created at a time when the wave was on its way out in the U.S., right? So as I had mentioned in uh, the course of my talk that uh, the, the, the MOOC years in the American Academy would be about 2011 to 2016. And by 2016, the MOOC myth had actually been busted in the US because completion rates kept falling massively. Right, so there were massive numbers of dropouts, right? So, and uh, the entire online learning bubble, right, so has actually completely busted in the US. And which is why you already have people in the US trying to move back into in-person modules of teaching already, already, right? So, so um, with the vaccination drive majorly underway in the U.S., right? And they, um, you have all these universities and colleges reopening, right? So there are hordes of students who are trying to return to their campuses right now. So the U.S. doesn't want to continue with the online bubble anymore. 
because they have got their lessons already. We have only learned to pick up discarded models, right? And um, as long as these discarded models are nonetheless profit reaping, right? So can nonetheless benefit private capital, right? So we will continue with these discarded models and create more and more development. Right, so, so uh, by 2016, when we started picking up on this MOOC, right, so when we started picking up on this on this wonderful song, right, so of uh, uh, an online revolution, right, so uh, it had the enthusiasm around online teaching in the US had almost died down. And there's a lot of work that has happened in the US which said that what Coursera and edX Right, so or Uda City, right? So what what all these um, courses actually did? Interesting, right? So in terms of the stage of capitalism that they actually brought into the U.S. Ac academy, right? So Christopher Newfield calls this right. So the leveraged buyout model, right? So in in more uh, plain economic terms, it would basically mean a private equity model of capitalism, right? So which means what? Uh, that you use the reputation or the brand capital of public universities and allow private companies to offer technological solutions by leveraging the reputation of public institutions. So you allow public institutes as conduits of profit generation for private capital. Right? So that is what happened in the US. And sooner or later, not just soon enough, right? So by 2016, the US university circuit realized this. That what Coursera and Uda City and edX were doing was that they were using the reputation of cities of acclaimed public universities, state universities in the US, and selling private solutions through a few celebrity professors. Right, so while adjunctifying the major teaching force, the major bulk of the teaching force. It happened. And in India, of course, there are all the conditions for making this possible, right? So with the kind of um, kind of stark divisions of labor and which is which is in in absolutely visible ways, right? So which is also caste-based divisions of intellectual labor, right? So where you have an entire Borgioning population of lecturers or guest lecturers, it is going to become so much easier, right? For an online teaching model to work in India, right? So, and it is going to become so much more dire than, it, than what it became in America. Right, so there are going to be so much more of dropouts from the system and the people who will drop out, right, and this is a very interesting point, the people who will eventually drop out from these courses are the people who the government will claim to have provided access to education. Precisely the, the Dalit Adivasi uh, women populations, right, so who will as the beneficiaries of an online transition, given a taste of higher education in the absence of access to physical infrastructures, they will be the ones out of the system, the earliest. So the 60% of the evacuation from any online course, right, which is the average rate, and this is, of course, as we all know, it's called the attrition rate, right? So you, Online courses in the U.S. has had have had the highest ever attrition rates in the history of education. Attritions in India will be precisely those very sectors, right? So those very populations which we will have claimed to have allowed access to education, right? So it is it is a complete reversal of the social justice narrative, right? So, and uh, a reversal of the social justice narrative in a very, very uh, dubious way. And that's what is going to happen. So you are right, I think. I mean, without um, uh, learning spaces and infrastructure and classroom and library, this is exactly what is going to happen, right? So because you will have an entire population coming in of intellectual capital, number one, and any kind of training of 
Taleem, right? So that is again, right? So that serves as the rite of passage for for people entering into higher education, and that is what makes higher education so very exclusionary. To have a prior history of intellectual socialization, so you will have entrance into higher education without that history of intellectual socialization. Who will thereafter find it extremely impossible or extremely difficult to keep up with these courses and will be forced to drop out. And that's that's exactly they will either be forced to drop drop out or they will be flunked, right? So, but the money will have been minted. Right, so so, uh, so that's um, <clears throat> the thing. Now, Johanna, again, I think very significant question. Yes, new Hitler youths, right? The stuff that that the NEP spells out in very many ways, right? So by talking of uh, big effort, right, so within the school cell sector, right, so which is a euphemism for uh, the RSS, right? So <clears throat> and it's very significant, right? So and. Uh, the schooling sector is uh, again another minefield, and I can't start talking about it. But you have the star scheme, right? So, which again, uh, while the pandemic was on, right? So, the government had given thousands of crores to, and which is a World Bank project, right? So, through which there is going to be a certain kind of learning management. <clears throat> and pedagogical training given to teachers in remote schools. Right, so you have international capital coming in, and you have private philanthropic effort, which would basically mean the sun coming in. So you have the nexus of, of course, the frontal organizations of the sun, right, as well as international capital funding sun activities in the schooling sector. <clears throat> and the result of it is something that can be very easily portended. And the NEP spells it out, right? So, again, right? So, it uses something from the Kuthari Commission report, which is called the school complex, right? And completely overturns the logic of it, right? So, by talking about a school complex as a space where there is going to be all these volunteerist efforts where private capital and philanthropic effort can come together and create the schools of the future, right? So, so yes, you're right. But if I have to actually get into that debate, it's going to be a way longer discussion. So I'm sorry, I have to uh, <clears throat> kind of cut that uh, discussion short, but I can talk to you later if you want to have a conversation about this. What you'd ask is, uh, uh, <clears throat> Yes, of course. Yeah. Can we also see this as an attack on the spaces uh, schools and colleges create for intellectual exchange? Oh, yes, of course. Absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> and coming on the heels of the anti-CA, anti-NRC movement, which was to a great extent foisted by university students and college Right, so this is exactly the best way. Online teaching becomes the best way of sanitizing institutional spaces, right? So of actually doing a Swachh Bharat Abhiyan on the uh, country's higher educational institutions. Right, so on the one hand that, and on the other hand, again, cutting off that very crucial nexus that served for the students' right of socialization into the life of the outside. Right, and what was that? Right, so to have, <clears throat> how did the student know of the world, right, so outside the university, while being within the university. The university is, of course, guilty of the worst forms of class and caste alliances. But despite that, right, so it is through these non-intellectual communities of labor, for example, the gardeners, the Malis, the barbers, the Xerox, the photocopier uh, 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 machine operators, right? So, so the, the canteen workers, these were the people, these were the sites of of political mobilization, of political imagination building for the university student. And the moment you move towards a technological solutions-based university, the moment you move towards this, this management order of a systems university, right? So you are actually doing away with all these non-intellectual communities of labor. You're basically saying that since there is no university in its physical embodiment anymore, you do not need the barber, 
the newspaper vendor. You do not need the janitor or the or the uh, gardener or the canteen worker anymore. <clears throat> All you need would be technical support staff. Right? So, so it's, it's also about taking away that entire world of transgressive socialization, world of political imagination building for the student, right? which was the outside of the university curated within its insides. Highly curated, but nonetheless, it was a curated outside within the university. And that was a very crucial space through which the student learned about things that one would read in class. It's not just studies in social exclusion that teaches one about the thing called social exclusion. It's, it's looking at the canteen workers. It's talking to the canteen workers, which teaches you that. Uh, thanks. Uh, I think uh, this uh, answer of yours ties neatly in with the last question that we had which is about uh, how this is a transformation in education and not education for transformation, which was the imagination of education in some ways, like in the contesting imaginations of education that we've had uh, post-independence uh, in India. Uh, but the other three questions that uh, Adarsh, Aman and Aditya have asked, I think point towards one common concern which is then that how do we respond to this uh, situation in our present context and also otherwise like what is the response to this vast kind of change that's been brought about in higher education and secondly tied to that the uh, uh, like kind of a sub question on like if the critique of access is not enough which is something we've established today then what can be that one point like is it this question of labor which you concluded with or just the imagination what is the alternative i think parts of it have been like running through your uh, uh, session <laughs> yeah this would be a good point also to conclude at because we've like we've been right. through two hours now yeah, yeah. So I think, yeah, so there are largely two pointers. How does one counter this online scourge? I think one of the major ways and which is something that we've been trying to argue for a fairly long period of time right now, right? So because all these policy onslaughts are also strung in number games, right, are also thrown at us through statistics, right? So, so these many numbers of people will um, get a chance to access higher education. These are the numbers of enrollments that we will get, right? So these many people will get access to these kinds of learning, etc. So since statistics is the language through which, right, so these policy changes are initiated, we have to learn to also speak the language of statistics, right? And which is why I use numbers and data. I think one of the things that we, within the higher education sector, are loath to learn is the language of numbers. We do not usually speak the language of numbers because we think, oh, statistics are manufactured. Yes, absolutely. And who knows it better than us? Right? <clears throat> And dealing with the kind of government data that we are bombarded with every day, who knows it better than us? Yes, statistics are manufactured, but to even say statistics is manufactured, right, so actually gets you into the same ideological trap, right, so which is a battle that is lost. We cannot fight the ideological battle through mere polemic anymore, right, so we have to throw statistics back at the government. We have to tell them that's exactly the attrition rate that online courses have had across the world them that there have been MOOCs that started out with this number of students and in their at the start of the third year they, these are the numbers of students that, that were there in the course. So these students who you are saying will get an access right to higher education are the ones to, to, be, to be dropping out at the very first instance. Right. Have to, now, this this uh, BL document has said that, um, uh, as I said, right. So, a blended learning environment is what a blended learning environment is in is a, is a wonderful blend, right? So it said something. 
It is, it is an accurate blend of apt curriculum and adequate resource. So now it says that, that the current existing curriculum is not good enough, right? So, so we have already had the CBCS being brought in in 2015 with the intention of making way for online education. Now CBCS has busted, right? So precisely because CBCS did not make the move all that seamless. It became apparent within a year or two, which is why the GC couldn't actually forcefully implement CBCS for three long years. Right, so on, on the rest of the country. So, so CBCS has failed. So now they want to bring in a new order of multidisciplinary curriculum. Now we have to ask the, the government, we have to ask UGC, what has CBCS achieved? Right, so if you look at the government's own data, and I have been looking at these data, right, so you will see that the AISHG report, the last AISHG report, 2018-19, actually shows that graduation rates have fallen in real terms. Disciplines, arts in Bachelor of Science, right, so, and as well as in Bachelor in BTEC courses, right, so barring, I think, only Bachelor of Engineering courses, in all other streams, right, so graduation rates have fallen with the coming of CBCS. So CBCS has actually increased dropouts. Why do we not have data about dropouts anywhere in the country? These are questions that we have to ask the government. That have to be asked in a concerted campaign format. These cannot be questions that we are just throwing at individual, right, or so some key spokespersons. Right, so <clears throat> we have to ask these questions in a concerted format as a policy critique, right? So, so uh, clearly, right, so in, and, and I think a lot of you know about this, right, so that there is no data in the country that accounts for dropouts in higher education, enrollment figures. No documentation published by the government ever says anything about the number of people who drop out. Now, for absence of data on dropouts, how do you even measure how much of a success one system is over another? That is something that we have to we have to uh, ask for, right? So when the government says that they don't have money to build more physical infrastructures, we have to say that your own CAG report in 2019, right? So say, says that 94,036 crores of money, which had been collected in the name of secondary and higher education, says from 2007 onwards to 2018 for. Seven years, 94,036 crores of direct tax revenue, unallocated, right? And this is direct tax revenue collected assess in the name of secondary and higher education. So where is all that money going? Right? So, so we have to learn to use these numbers against the government. Now, the final question, I think... Um, um, I have just forgotten what the final question was. Could we, um, Shambhavi, could you please just remind me once again? Yeah. No, I think uh, this was like, in terms of both like response to this policy, as well as what kind of response can we imagine as students, faculty, and members of... Right. Like a broader response, because one of the questions was like, as, as civil society and as the student community, how do we resist move because that's been a question also for all of us but yeah this was the running thing so if you want to address that at the end yeah i think i mean there are several strategies right we have to create alternative manifestos for uh, imagining a life beyond the pandemic and not just play with stupid terms like the new normal Right, so which is something that has become the order of all kinds of conversation within the academia or oh, the new normal. Right, so and I think what what I think it's a criminal term. Right, so this new normal. Right, so it basically normalizes a crisis. Right, so it basically says that oh, we have to make do. Right, let us refuse to normalize an exception and imagine better times. And that is the work that takes a lot of labor labor to imagine a return and a return to a better time right so not just a return to the status quo right so let us try and do that kind of imaginative labor and i think i mean 
I, I often keep uh, harping on um, uh, uh, Fred Motain and Stefano Harney, right? And their fantastic book called The Undercommons, where they say that the only relationship that one can have with the university is a criminal one. Now, now, what do we mean by a criminal relationship with the university? Do we, uh, uh, do we basically try and siphon things off from the university? No, right? So, uh, I think what what uh, Harney and Motel are saying is that the only the only political exercise that one can do with the university way of using its resources for benefits that were not intended by its policy planners. So I keep harping on this idea that we have to try and uh, use our university spaces as spaces where we can open night schools for the children of immigrant labor. Let us bring the schools of Shaheen Bagh or from the, uh, along the Tikri border, right? So let us bring those schools onto the university spaces. Let us steal the university's resources and enable spaces of connection and moments of connection which, with those sectors of intellectual labor that the university has always believed it is above and beyond of. Right? So, so let us try and connect with primary education. And the only way we can do it is by opening night schools. Right? And we can open those same makeshift schools that we were running along the sides of protest right? and bring them back into the, into the university in some way or the other. Right? So, so I think I mean, it's time that we, that we try and connect with the other orders of Right? So the higher education has to live beyond its highness and its height. Right? So it has to live beyond the haughtier of being higher than the next. Right? So it has to connect with schooling in some way or the other for any kind of imaginative way possible. And that's something that we have to together and we have to collectively think about. Thank you. Uh, I think on that note, conclude the discussion for today. Uh, I want to thank you on behalf of Collective and I thank uh, everyone who's joined us here and on uh, Facebook questions uh, and engaged in the discussion. Uh, if on behalf of everyone, when I say that we'll stay in conversation in the future as we reimagine and situate like education not divorced from it as we've discussed uh, so far in our discussion uh, today uh, and we'll stay engaged with each other in the struggle against the present policy and imagination of education which is being regime in uh, power one for joining and we hope events and uh, campaigns in the future and yeah change that Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You guys have been doing fantastic work and I would really look forward to collaborating and uh, putting my my uh, own thoughts along with yours right and trying to work out. <laughs>